Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Is that how you'd like to start? No. Oh. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Jonathan C. Gillespie. Gillespie. Hey everybody, welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I believe this is episode 74. <laughs> well, now you're taking a step back for once. You were close. It's 137, actually, though. Okay. I am Rish out house. <laughs> that one you're right on with. Good job. And I am big ankle break. I know I get repetitive <laughs> on this. It seems like forever since we've done one of these. It does. And that's because it has been. Oh, well. But we're back. Yes, we're back. We're here doing another episode, which seemed dubious for a while there yeah well, really every new episode is another miracle Aww. people think miracles don't exist anymore well that's not true because our show is still going yeah <laughs> i think part of the miracle uh should be laid at the feet of uh, tanya milosevic how, how is it i think it's milojevic because it's a j in there okay. not tanja a- milojevic I think it's Tanya Milojevich. I think okay. both J's are pronounced the same, and they're both J's there. Look, you can please her first name all of the time. Or <laughs> All right. She produced this episode, and I know she's done episodes in the past for us. Tanya did a peace. The which, wait, what is peace? I mean, I know what peace <laughs> is, but what was the name of that story? Uh, that story was called Peacemaker, Peacemaker, Little, Little Bo, Bo Peep, Peep right. by Jason Sanford. And then she also did a Halloween episode for us in 2011, I guess that would have been. It was the Silk for Moisture, Mud for Shine. Very cool. And now she's back for a third go around. She's back for more, like the dog that keeps coming back to the master that is cruel to it. Aww. <laughs> Wait, wait. Is one of us supposed to be a dog in this scenario? Uh Uh-huh. So she produced this episode. What is the story today? The story today is called Todd Elrin and the Forever Reset by Jonathan C. Gillespie. Gillespie. Terrible. Yes, Jonathan C. Gillespie is the writer on today's story. It's a really interesting coinkadink this story. Um, I guess we'll talk about it more after the show, though, because we have a tendency to blather on way too long before the story airs. You said it, Big! Okay, announcer man. How about telling me about today's author? Uh, oh, okay, so Jonathan C. Gillespie has a dozen short fiction tales published in a variety of online and print outlets on three continents, including the Drabblecast, Spine Tingler Magazine, Afterburn SF, and the sorely missed Murky Depths. He's got a dozen more credits since he sold this one to us because it's been such a long time we always take. And Murky Depths is probably back in business again. I don't know. (laughs) His short fiction has been nominated for both the Parsecs and the British Science Fiction Association Awards. And his tale, The 18th Floor received an honorable mention in Best Horror of the Year, Volume 1. He was a frequent contributor to the Outstanding Variant Frequencies podcast. In the near future, he will be embarking on self-publishing, including his all-new novel, a military science fiction thriller called The Tyrant Stratagem. Probably already out. It's probably sequelized by now. Yeah, considering our snail's pace. He invites interested readers to check out his official website and blog. See link in the show notes. He lives in the ever-expanding suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia, with his wife, daughter, and an unrelenting penchant for telling stories. One uh, interesting aspect about this author, unlike anybody else we've had on the show, this is the first author who has his own theme song. That's right. Sing it with me, folks. 
Jonathan C. Gillespie. Todd Elrin and the Forever Reset by Jonathan C. Gillespie. Fireworks boomed in the night sky over Hinch, Haiti, illuminating with flashbulb intensity stands of trees and fields of new crops. A warm wind drifted in from the west, wrapping itself around the walls of a plain house in the hills, finding its way up the steps of a porch and across the face of a man that called himself Todd Elrin. Tomorrow, he'd have a different name. He waved a mosquito away with one hand, sat his drink on a nearby table with the other, and walked to the porch's wooden railing, looking out over the fields. It had been a good year, exactly a year. He'd done a lot. The engineered bacteria he'd brought with the pod had thrived in the soil, reinvigorating it even beyond his original expectations. With the renewed landscape came hope. More smiles everywhere he looked. They could look forward to a world where eating clay was a memory. At least for a while. He couldn't stay. It was December 31st, 2011. He didn't want to be around for a moment of 2012. He sighed. He'd be leaving behind another batch of friends, never to see them again. Each reset felt harder. Each time, he was more reluctant to leave. Were the resets really worth avoiding the catastrophic events that lay ahead? He slid open the glass door and walked inside, the cooled air of the living room welcoming him. Only his closest friends knew he had such luxuries, and none of them knew about the other item in the house. He stepped through the kitchen, passing the counter and the last pot of chic thai, a food he'd fallen in love with since his arrival a year earlier. Todd walked to a blank wall, glanced back one last time at this latest life to be left behind, and said, Portal code 428. Part of the kitchen wall vanished, dropping a rack of spices to the floor. The container spun and clattered to a stop. Through the short opening, a narrow alloy ramp led downward through a metallic passageway illuminated by red light. He walked down the ramp. He reached the bottom, facing a metal door. He waved his hand and the door retracted away on three sides, exposing a room beyond. His time stream pod and a woman sitting in the chair in front of the pod's hollow control console. Don't, she said, shaking her head. And he didn't. Just stood, waiting, frozen in place. She had... Close-cut brown hair, narrowed green eyes, and held an energy pistol in one hand. She wore a bluish silver bodysuit with a utility bandolier over one shoulder. He knew nothing like her gear existed anywhere else. At least, not yet. The pistol whined in her hand, charged up. I broke your toy, she said, turning in the chair, letting him see past her to the console. His eyes widened. A smoking cavity had replaced the controls, extending deep into the electronics, where the organic computer's titanium casing bled fluid, its biological components sizzling. What name would it have been this time? Since you know your real name has a huge target painted on it, doesn't it, Lyndon Andrews? Lyndon. He hadn't gone by his true name in so long it felt strange to hear it. But that emotion was irrelevant now. Does it matter? Elentians aren't known for their curiosity. So do it. End it. She rose, walked over to him, and with a quick motion, slammed the butt of the pistol across his face. He collapsed onto the floor, pain spread across the right side of his jaw. He had to assume she was an enforcer. They were the taskmasters of Elentia, the last nation. 
the nation he'd escaped from, which held absolute authority in the year 2094. She'd destroyed his time pod. He'd never be able to replace its organic components. Now he had no options, no way but the hopelessness of proceeding forward into the coming year. Cutting his legs off would have hampered his mobility less. She had utterly amputated his freedom. Was it better to linger and suffer in the wastes of a slipping world, subjected to the horrors of a global collapse? Faced with that finality, wouldn't death really be the only path for the illuminated? And yet, something in him couldn't give up. Maybe it was the same thing that drove him to steal the pot in the first place. Get up, Lyndon. There's a lot for you to answer to. He felt dizzy, almost delirious from the impact. He forced himself to his feet, grunting from his left knee's pain. He'd injured it six resets ago in Paraguay. Upstairs. You can place the charges yourself. She followed him up to the kitchen. Stop. Turn around. Lyndon turned to face her. She took one of three small metallic canisters from her belt and dropped it on the floor, then nodded towards the kitchen wall. Right there. And don't be stupid. It'll only key off to my verbal authorization to detonate. He bent down and picked up the charge, hesitating. Now. Lyndon walked over to the stucco wall, holding the charge against it. It magnetically anchored itself in place. She dropped another canister to the floor. Let's go. Living room. She gestured in that direction with the pistol. I don't know why you're doing this. He said, taking the charge. Tomorrow it's the first day of 2012. It's not like Alentia will really be affected by anything I do here in 2011. Whether I am dead or not, a few months from now, the economy will go from a slow decline into a tailspin. The wars will start up. Thirty years of famine, destruction, chaos, oppression. She slammed her boot into his back, and he went tumbling over the couch, slamming into the floor. When he rolled over, she was atop him, pistol shoved against his jaw, indenting the flesh around the muzzle. It's 2011 out there, but the end is near. He'd seen the hidden historical records. He'd been granted access when he was building the time stream pod. By early 2012, the nations began to decline, starting with the major powers most reliant on each other and dwindling resources. First, food supplies tanked, hunger rose, and reason died. Then bloody riots spread across the world, Dictators rose and fell just as quickly. Martial law was enacted, but crumbled under bloody coups and violent rebellions. Desperate, fragile nations scrambled for oil, arable land, even supplies of water. When negotiations failed, the fighting intensified. The resource wars washed over the world like a global volcanic eruption of aggression. Insane battle cries rose above burning cities, Blood flowed through the streets like rivers of red tears. Mankind struggled amongst itself in savage warfare across the lands made dead by its arsenals. A wild, mad humanity wrestled around in the dirt like primates. You going to miss it? Since you trashed my machine? Don't worry. Just wait a while. Elentia will be back. My father wanted me to make sure you begged. So beg, you bastard. She ground the pistol against his cheek. Uh, don't you have a house to blow up? This brought another slap of the pistol across the side of his face. You didn't think he'd find out about all your resets to January 2011? I guess it's easier to go savage the timeline rather than stay and improve things. Improve Elentia. Wonder where I'd start. I guess we could put the starving to work painting the exterior walls bright colors. Have the propaganda drones, the ones that buzz around amongst the forced laborers, have them remind everyone of how fortunate they are to be alive in the last place fit for habitation, even if it's in Siberia. Siberia. 
the only region 21st century civilization hadn't ruined in its death throes. After the wars, what was left of mankind gathered there, a conglomeration of refugees. Among them rose the strongest. They called themselves the Lords of Alentia and ruled over the rest. And oh, how they ruled. You don't get it, do you? You did change things, Lyndon. More than the abuse she'd done to him, this surprised him the most. He didn't know how to react. I guess that surprises you. But there won't be an Alentia. You betrayed everyone. My father, the other lords, everyone! He tried not to smile through the pain. I know you're pleased. But something else happened. Those that would still be born and had lived in the right future kept their knowledge of the world they should know, down to every last would-be memory. No one else believes anything they say, of course. If they mention Alentia, they're put in a ward, watched over constantly for any sign of this shared dementia the shrinks think they have. They call it Apocalypse Syndrome. She rose off him and stood, then kicked him in the ribs. But she could have kicked harder, and he sensed it. He still scrambled across the floor from her. Do you understand me? Two or three thousand people remember things as they should have been, coupled with the new experiences of a changed timeline. Like my father, thanks to you, I've been on the run with him because... I wouldn't let him be hunted down by those who still have grudges against him for things that won't even happen now. I was supposed to be a member of the ruling class, not living my life in fear of the powerful and their revenge. If your father was an Alentian, then you should know what they were like. She shook her head. He told me everything. He had been a great leader, holding together the remnants of a great race so that they could rebuild. And you know what else? He told me you'd pull out every trick you could to stop me. I want the second charge on that wall. She indicated with the pistol. Now! He reached over and grabbed the charge from the floor where it had spun to a stop, and stood walking to the wall. He anchored the charge just to the right of the painting that hung there. He turned to face her. Why here? If you wanted to erase any trace of what I'd done, you should have turned up in my first reset in Alaska, where I'm living right now at 23 years of age. Or were you even aware of that first pod jump back from 2094? Yes. I had your quantum signature. I could have killed you at any time. So you knew the exact route I took? yet still didn't kill me at the moment I arrived in Alaska, 2011. She didn't answer. What about my eighth reset? I'm teaching over in Iraq right now. You could have removed me and no one would have suspected anything other than insurgents. Or when I was in Belgium, I lived alone in a studio apartment. I worked as a janitor. Why not then? Because you're older now. Easier to knock off. That's the best you can do? What kind of assassin are you? You don't hesitate with a mark. Didn't your father teach you that? Shut up! She fired the pistol three times, lighting up the air with blue bolts. He raised his arms instinctively, covering his face. But when he checked, three sizzling holes marked the damage in the walls. She dropped another canister at his feet. Last one. Far wall, near the windows. Who's your father? She leveled the pistol at his head. And he noticed, for the first time, that it was too well made. That pistol's craftsmanship is remarkable. This place you came from, it's really not the hellhole Elentia was, is it? Pick up the charge. You're going to kill me anyway. Just tell me if your father is who I think he is. She moved even closer, aiming the barrel of the pistol at his temple. Is this really what you want on your conscience, Callista? The expression that crossed her face told him everything. How the hell did you know my name? Your father has to be Jaeger Olstrom, leader of the Loyalty Order. He was sterile from the wars, a very bitter man. 
He always fantasized about having children, and said if he had a daughter, her name would be Callista. She slumped down into the chair, resting the pistol on her lap. For a moment, they looked at each other in silence. Seems pretty final, doesn't it? Was Zelentia too final for you? Still a lot of anger behind her words, but now something else. Maybe something that had been there the whole time. What he thought he'd noticed earlier. 200,000 people crammed into a walled fortress city. People were lucky to last through their 20s. I didn't want to die because I'd been caught in a rad storm, been jumped by one of the starving youth gangs, or said something sufficiently anti-patriotic, as Jaeger used to put it. So I took one of the pods I'd been working on and came here, 2011, the apex of the human race. After this year, we stumble, then fall. And I didn't think we'd ever get back up, especially not since Elentia will one day be the only power in existence. Callista kept the pistol pointed at him. Her jaw was set firmly. You can kill me whenever you want to, but give a dead man his due. What did I do? How did I stop it? Please. I can't reset anymore. You took care of that. Just tell me what kind of 2012 and beyond I'm looking at. She stood. No. Place the last charge. He bent down to take the charge, then suddenly lashed out, knocking her arm upwards. The pistol discharged a shot into the ceiling. She brought the pistol back down, but he grabbed her arm and jerked it to point the pistol away from him. Two more shots into the painting, leaving a quarter-sized hole, then one through a pot in the kitchen, sending it spinning, throwing rice everywhere. They tumbled to the floor. Callista tried to bring her heel atop Lyndon's back, but he pinned her legs with his own and wrenched the pistol from her fingers, pointing it at her chest. You're no Elentian enforcer. And you were never even going to be born without me. Don't you get that? Angry tears streamed down her face, dabbing the wood floor shining in the light. He stood up and backed away from her, yelling. So I'll ask again. Why attack me now? Why not earlier? She sat up, buried her head in her hands, and sobbed. He softened despite himself. Callista, why not earlier? Before all the resets. Because I didn't believe him! He waited, unsure what to say as she cried. She straightened up, wiping her face. I listened to him all the time. All those damn stories about a lynch and... How it had been so great. All while we were on the run, hiding in the back cars of freight trains, run down auto hotels, sometimes in the streets. But I kept my eyes open too. And what did you see? She composed herself for a moment. There's a statue near the square where I was born. Robert Hitch is a hero of the Western Republic. Lyndon was shocked. Yes, a free republic. Hitch brokers a treaty between India and China in 2038, keeps them from going to war, millions are saved. But Hitch himself was saved early in life. Hitch had been on a dock in Juneau, Alaska, where he'd grown up. He fell in. This unidentified individual jumped in after him, but never gave his name to the papers. Jager thought Robert Hitch must have been saved by you when you were living under one of your many aliases. That little kid? So he was right. She paused for a moment. You befriend anyone during your second reset in 2011 to Ireland? A, a few, sure. Edward Durfee, Scott Pollard, Tim... Stop. Pat Scott Pollard? What did you do? I helped Scott with a small project he'd been working on. Then that was it. Two years from now, he stumbles onto a key element for an, an advanced, super-efficient battery. It revolutionizes transportation. Linden, it's one of the advances that, that weans the world off of oil. She tented her hands. You mentioned Iraq earlier? Reset 8. I'm 31 over there right now, teaching classes. I needed to stock up on some dollars, and the pay was good. That class of students you taught... Several of them ended up going on to other things. What other things? 
All Jeter told me was he was surprised your teaching did that much good. <laughs> he was equally surprised about the rebellion in the Republic of Congo. He smiled. Reset nine. I used a micro drone camera to snatch some film. They'd been bringing political troublemakers off the street and locking them up, and anyone that tried to report it to the outside world was winding up in the same fate. Lyndon lowered the pistol and sat on the table. She sat down on his couch. Damn you, Lyndon. Why do you have to do it? If you had just stayed low profile, my father might have given up. Might not have. She looked away. Untold years she'd lived on the run, as Jaeger tried to brainwash her. He felt a wave of pity for her. I had to. At first I wanted to come back and hide here, stay anonymous, live the best year of humanity. But I learned about the people here, made friends. I, I just couldn't give up on them. I had hope. That's a powerful thing, Callista. Hope. It is indeed. Your assumption was right. Instead of Alentia, the future, my future, is a world with problems, but it's getting better. Most of the century-old conflicts that had dotted the world like scars were dying out when I left. Instead of the resource wars, we had already started extending outward and putting colonies on the moon, Mars, and even Europa. I wish I could take you ahead in time, show you what you did. But returning would put you on the run again, make you a target for those that might want to get even with your father by harming you. And I imagine your father had help sending you back. Other Elentian hardliners with memories of dominance? She nodded. They wouldn't be happy. Couldn't anyway. We learned something else. That your travels back isolated you from the future that you created. Much like those suffering from the effects of the Alentia Syndrome have memories of the world that should have been. How did you learn that? Because you won't exist anymore in that timeline. Just in their memories. You won't be born, Lyndon. You are cut out of the timeline. Your parents never meet in the Fortress City. He turned the pistol over in his hands, shaking his head, then placed it on his coffee table. For a while, there was silence. You can take it if you want it, but I think you know as well as I do that it's needless to use. She picked it up, looked at him. She placed it back on the table. Her fingertips stayed on it a moment more, then she drew them back. I'm tired of carrying it. I've hauled enough of my dad's lies around. So what will you do? What is there to do? I'll destroy this wrist device and be done with it. Your pod is useless now. Where will you go? They expended what little resources they had sending me back. I don't think we'll see anyone else from 2094, but still, I might want to lay low. I don't know. I'll decide tomorrow. Tomorrow. So, we face 2012. They're celebrating outside. She shrugged. I'm sure you've been up to your usual meddling out here. I'm sorry for what you were put through. He knew she didn't fully forgive him. It was just too soon. But maybe, of all things, time would address that. Care to join me? That's unless you're interested in pistol-whipping me again. He opened the sliding door to the deck. Callista sighed and followed him, leaving the pistol on the table. She stood to his right and watched the fireworks boom in the sky. They're beautiful. Wait until you see what's coming. Now, a word about today's story. This story's roots were planted when the uh, mortgage bubble began to unwind in 2008. Of course, as a result, the post-apocalyptic and disaster subgenres have done really well lately. I love this kind of genre. I've always been a huge fan of the Mad Max movies and things like that, but I definitely side more in the camp that doesn't see mankind ever really going extinct so much as kind of undergoing a titanic societal change. I just don't agree that we're automatically doomed to some dark future, in large part because I'm a Christian, 
but I wanted to really bring humanity's resilience and ability to steer its future for the better into a story since everything and everyone seemed so negative at the time of the mortgage collapse. I thought people needed to be reminded that though we're all passengers on a raft and a river current, we, we kind of all carry oars. So I started thinking about the holdout areas on the planet, the areas where no one would really be motivated to wage war, and I kept coming back to Siberia, which is pretty lifeless, not good for farming, that sort of thing. But I imagined some enterprising faction establishing a base of operations around a nucleus of refugees, who of course would be desperate for any sort of order. Out of that came Valencia and its corrupt leaders. I didn't want to focus the story at that city-state, though, because then it would just be another archetypical post-apocalyptic yarn. So what I imagined was a dissident that fled back in time from that future and changed it for the better, not because he had any set goal to change things, but because he simply held a decency while trying to lay low. In, in other words, there wouldn't really be anything terribly special about him beyond you know, some very important technical knowledge. Uh, but I wanted to add an element where those that would have been alive in the original future remembered everything that happened in the original timeline. Uh, it would be fun to play with, and it just made sense that a few of them would then plot revenge. So that's where the assassin came in, and of course everything fell together at that point. The uh, tale initially made it all the way to top tier to pro mag, but was mer uh, nearly rejected. Uh, so I submitted it here and there, and occasionally I'd update the upcoming New Year referenced in the story. And the reason I did that was I always wanted Lyndon Andrews' future to be right over the horizon. Ironically, I thought we'd have pulled out of our mess way sooner, and I kept thinking the tale wouldn't be as topical anymore if it didn't soon get published. Uh, I am thrilled that it's finally found a home, and I really hope the listeners out there have enjoyed it, and I thank you so much for listening. All right, everybody, welcome back from the story i hope you enjoyed it our cast list for today's story is a simple one the story was narrated by myself big anglovich todd elrin slash what was his other real name i've forgotten Lyndon it now something. Lyndon b johnson was played by rish outfield and Callista was played by tanya milojevic who produced who also produced the story, yes. I really appreciate her doing that. Every time somebody produces for us, we have one more episode we wouldn't have had. <laughs> That's otherwise. right. The which miracles. Sounds, which, which sounds redundant, but there are some stories we never would have gotten to had somebody not volunteered. We would have just been like, you know, I know it's been two years. <laughs> Send it somewhere else. We like your story, but we're just not, you know. That would have happened with many, many stories a long time ago. Probably, yeah. It's a wonderful thing that people are willing to volunteer and keep this train a running. So this story was an interesting beast. We do the contest every so often called the Broken Mirror Story event. For us, it's an event. I, I think believe for that's you what and we me, call it. Was it. just the Broken Mirror Story exercise. So it was still the same initials. <laughs> still BMSC. There you go. We do that every year and that or every. Sorry, every so often. And uh, that is when we give all our listeners a topic and we say, write a story about this. And then we judge all the stories and decide the best. And then we podcast those. Now, there's another story that we've done that could very well be a Broken Mirror story twin to this one. I remember when we did the story in the first place, I thought, wow, this is like a concept in time travel that I've never heard of before or even thought of before. This is really cool. What was the name of the first story? The original story was called This Must Be the Place by, I can't remember his name. Jonathan C. Gillespie. No, no. Don't be shy. <laughs> Get a little closer before your time to die. Elliot Bangs. And that was about a guy who hated the way the world had turned out and had a time machine. And so he went back to what he considered to be the best year ever. And he just kept reliving it over and over and over again. It's a similar concept. I mean, we could have said, we could have done one of those broken mirror things and said, okay, here's your premise. A guy lives the same year over and over again. Go. The coolest thing about it is these two stories are so different from each other, despite the fact that they have that one thing in common. 
not very similar at all the tone of the stories the way the story was told or anything or even what the guy was doing right living the years over and over again I, were you at all tempted to pass on this story because of its similarity to this must be the place i'll have to admit i was a little bit and tempted to take it just because of that you know what i mean oh. this hey this is almost the same thing that would be really cool we could talk about that and blah blah or Oh, this is almost the same thing. We probably better not do that. Or people be like, yeah, you guys are just playing the same story over and over again. As somebody who writes the same story over and over again, I really liked this story on a couple of different levels. And my only problem with it is the 2011 thing. And I sent him an email when we first accepted the story. And uh, I said, (laughs) look, 2011 is almost over. By the time we get this on, you know, it'll be early 2012. (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, you know, do you want to change it to 2012 rather than 2011? And he said, yes. <laughs> I, so I don't have an answer for you on that. He said he didn't want to change it unless it was going to be late in 2012 that we finally put it out. But I see I, my memory was that he had a specific reason that it needed to be 2011. And that's, that's why we left it 2011 and didn't change it to 2012. But when I read his response, it was what you just said. He wrote it in like 2008, 2009. And every year he would bump up the year when he'd send the story out. And I guess he was planning on doing that here. So I think maybe I dropped the ball on this one. I'm sorry. Well, we did send it out to get started on the production. It's been like six months or so as his per our general super slow speed. So maybe at the time we thought, oh yeah, now that'll be fine. And now that we're finally getting to it, it turns out, oh shoot, we probably should have done that. But I don't know. I mean, that kind of thing happens all the time with science fiction when it comes down to it. Because science fiction is always set in the near future or set in you know a time that's so far away, like 2010. You know, the world will be ended by that time. The author will be long dead by that time. But you know what? We've already passed a lot. You know, like we talk about it sometimes. The Transformers movie was set in 2005 because that was 20 years from when they made it. When we made it in 1985. And by that point, we had spaceships and we were flying to Cybertron and all that kind of crap. And now we're long past 2005 and it just seems kind of silly. And there's lots of sci-fi movies or books or whatever that are like that. You know, that time has come and gone, but it doesn't really make the story no good anymore or make it any less worthwhile or less relevant. I mean, like the book 1984, obviously, you know, 1984 was the big year that was to come and it came and went, but people still... Read 1984 all the time, still find it a classic and find it important. If they made a movie of 1984 now, obviously the target audience would be teenagers, because it always is. (laughs) Um, How many of them would be like, All of them. (laughs) You can't make a teenager a target audience for 1984. Well, then do you change it to 2084? Maybe. Because people like you and me... And anyone older than us would be outraged if they changed the title of this famous book just because of fear of idiots out there. (laughs) Maybe they could change it to something not year related. You know, sometimes they make books like Red Dragon was made into a movie called Manhunter. Why they changed it to Manhunter, I have no idea. Why they couldn't just use Red Dragon. I mean, that's a pretty catchy exciting sounding title for a fantasy movie yeah maybe that's what they thought people be like oh no i'm not watching a movie about a dragon don't quote your wife (laughs) Uh, okay well so i guess i got off topic on that but it's just i would like to see a new movie based on 1984 because it's a powerful novel i just hope they use the van halen song in it somehow all right (laughs) and i i veto that so hopefully your vote and my vote cancel one another out I, for some reason, I remember 12 Monkeys that Madeline Stowe's character is giving this big presentation about future predictions and Cassandra complex. And she talks about this guy who predicted 
So this guy in World War I who predicted that the end of the world was going to come in, in 1996. And everybody in the audience goes, ooh, and they look around and there's chuckles and all that because it takes place in 1996. And uh-huh. That, ooh, chuckle or whatever, I guess would still work if it's referring to a year in the past, but not near, it just the, the idea that this is, what, well, 2012, it's almost over, the end of the Mayan calendar. Generations from now, people will talk about whether there was panic about 2012, whether there were people who actually believed the world was going to end in 2012, in the same way that we would laugh at the people that were worried about Y2K or worried about 1900. I mean, apparently 1900 scared the crap out of a lot of Pretty people. Pretty much any round number does that. But Why um, 1K? I think they burned a lot of witches and stuff like that to try and make sure that the world wouldn't come to an end, I think. It, and 1500, I think they did the same thing. Just any good round number. Well, you know your history. No, I, do. I don't. So uh, if anyone was taken out of the story because of the 11 rather than the 12, then I apologize for that. But I hope that nobody was. It just I think what you're saying is a good story is still a good story, even if it's set 100 years past. Right, right. I mean, even if we bumped it up to 2012, the most. I mean, we've been doing this podcast since, what, 2008? I believe so. So four years from now, this file most likely will still be on the internet somewhere. Someone can listen to it and they can go, oh, 2011, that didn't happen in 2000. That was stupid. You know, they're not going to do that. No matter what year you set it at as the near future, we're going to pass it. And soon. Because it's the near future instead of the far future. At least Transformers made it 2005 when it was 1985. So it took 20 years for us to pass it up and go, oh, that's silly. Yeah, we got Back to the Future 2 coming up in 2015. Yeah. with the uh, I, I saw somebody post that Hasbro has... Just like two more years to develop those hoverboards. Those hoverboards Come on, boards ready? Yeah, Back to the Future. Oh, it was Mattel. All right, I mean. Oh, was it Mattel? Sorry, I'm from Hasbro. I'm from Mattel. Well, I'm not actually from Mattel. I'm from a, a smaller company that was purchased in a Liverance buyout. Anyways, um, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of movies like that. Anything that involves time travel or the future or all that kind of stuff quickly becomes dated, and uh, there's no way to avoid that. Because time marches on. You're older than you've ever been. And now you're even older. And now you're even older. And now you're even older. And now you're older still. Oh, wow. (laughs) I love to play that song every year on my birthday just to, you know, get in the right spirit for the day. It's like a Christmas carol, you know, you listen to it so you can get in that Christmas spirit. I listen to that. You're older than you've ever been. So I can get into that, you know, really depressed, damn, I'm old kind of a spirit for my birthday. Cool. Or the opposite of cool. (laughs) So the the theme of this story, remember when you were in school and they'd be like, you have to identify what the theme was of stuff. And you, I don't know about you. I hated that I did too. when they'd say, you have to figure out what the theme was. And I think it was just because the theme had this mystic connotation that there was a correct answer. Right. And F that man. Probably, you know, that most likely if you came up with a theme, the teacher may well have a different theme that they wanted you to get out of it. And maybe your theme isn't good enough and would get a, a red check instead of a green check. But what I got, my theme from Todd Elrin and the Forever Reset was pretty much the same theme as It's a Wonderful Life. Everybody's life touches other people's lives. And you may think that you don't make a difference, but you do. And every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. That's right. That's right. (laughs) Don't you dare go there. Harry wasn't there to save them because you weren't there to save Harry. Morons. That's a lie. Harry Bailey went to war. He saved every life on that transport. Everyone on that transport died. (laughs) Rish, you're (laughs) such an idiot. Harry wasn't there to save them because you weren't there to save Harry. Ladies and gentlemen, the Parsec-nominated Doonstief team. That what you wanted me to say? Yeah, that was the line. Well, I think Todd Elrin, just from being a good man and trying to make use of his time, good use of his time, caused ripples 
that changed the whole world. And I love that idea. I mean, I don't know that I necessarily subscribe to it with my life, but just the idea that the world without you would be a grayer place. That little things that you think are unimportant are totally, compoundly, incredibly important. I don't know. I I, I couldn't. The, the funny thing is, and it's the same way with the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. If you sat George Bailey down and said, okay, what are the most important things you did in, his, in your life? He wouldn't come up with all the things probably that he then went and witnessed in the world without him. You know, he wouldn't be like, oh yeah, old man, whatever, the pharmacist, I kept him from giving that poison that one time. You know, he, he probably wouldn't even remember that. And if he did, he might not consider that to be all that big of a deal or all the other things. Yeah, he pulled his brother out of the ice. It was just part of them going sledding or whatever, you know, it's just a funny story. Like sometimes I'll tell the story about how we went to visit the Hoover Dam and I stood up on the rail or whatever and then my dad pulled me off of there and I didn't plummet to my death. But I never tell it as though my life was saved and it was a huge moment or something like that. But maybe my dad, if he had his It's a Wonderful Life, I'm dead because I fell off the freaking Hoover Dam one day because he wasn't there to save me. If you had to sit down and look back at your life and think... What were the things that were important that I did that changed things for the better? You probably couldn't come up with them. But every one of us, you know, we interact with so many people throughout our lives. Thousands and thousands of people come and go from our lives. You know, one year you spend all your time with this girl who's your girlfriend or whatever during that year. And then you break up. Or or in, in my case, no one. Right. You break up eventually and you don't see them again or you're not a friend of this particular friend that you used to always do all your stuff with. Now he's moved to Kinnebunkport, Maine. And so you never see the guy, but you used to do all sorts of stuff. And surely you've made an influence on them because of the time that you spent. Was it a good influence? Was it a bad influence? Did it change them for the better? You have no idea. Until they friend you on Facebook, you'll never know. Well, if your dad hadn't pulled you off and you had died... The world would be a better place. When you were a kid. Oh, sorry. What? Okay, so you got four kids <laughs> that would right. pop out of existence. Right. That That's the most obvious. Right. The kids from your seed plus the many that we don't know about. <laughs> and how about the little girl that you rescued from the well, the homeless guy that, you know... Right, yeah. It's not blind and you pulled him off the freeway, you know, these things. Yeah, all the people that I saved from that crashed transport, they wouldn't have been saved because my dad wasn't there to save me. I want to live. Go, Aaron. Like I'm saying, I don't know what things I did that were worthwhile. Obviously, yeah, my children wouldn't exist. My wife would be the old maid that works at the library. Only part I don't buy from that. (laughs) Yes, I've said that before. Those are obvious things that would be different. There would be no Dune Steve podcast. And so therefore all the great joy that we brought to people's lives by way of the Dune Steve would not have existed. There, there would still be an equivalent to the Dune Steve. It would just have a much better title. Yeah. There would be some podcast out there called the podcast that dares not speak its name. Wow. Just imagine. What, what, what would that sound like, announcer man? Uh, huh? I wonder what the alternative universe that includes that podcast is like. Probably this, the darkest of the timelines. <laughs> Speaking of that, the darkest of the timelines, you know, that episode of Community gave us a really interesting example where they rolled the dice and depending on what number came up, Everything was different, you know, different stuff happened. And and that very well may be the way things are, you know what I mean? Like so many... That there is a multiverse? Not that there's a multiverse, but that there's so many tiny little decisions that we make that could change things so much that, you know, like this Todd Elrin guy who did something small, he saved a kid from drowning in, in Alaska, I believe it was, right? And uh, that guy went on to be this wonderful dude who got a statue in his memory all the way a hundred years later in Alentia, which didn't exist at that point and was now the... It was called New Des Moines in the (laughs) Altered Timeline. 
all these little tiny things that you might do make such a difference. It's it's interesting to think about that with the whole rolling of the dice. Who goes to get the pizza and what happens? Jeff's arm gets cut off and Britta gets that blue stuff in her hair that she can't get out. You really remember that episode. I loved that episode. That was my favorite episode. I believe that was actually nominated for the Hugo that year too. Along with the four Doctor Who episodes, which of course Doctor Who won as it does every year. When does Community start up again? February. Oh, it's February? I thought it was going to be soon. Come back, which is Friday, so February far. 13th. Yeah, I know it's, it is. But All the way in 2013. That's probably when our next episode will come out, so it's probably not really all that far. Back on topic, guys. Uh, you know, I think that the uh, the character of Callista is interesting, the, the assassin. Uh-huh. At first, I think while we were listening to it, I told you, you know, that's a hard character for me to like. Right. She pistol whips him, the guy like four times. And, and then cries about the fact that she doesn't get to be like the emperor of the galaxy or whatever. She's like, oh, you poor dear. You don't get to be Caligula. I feel so bad for you. <laughs> Yeah, and that was my initial impression of the character. But about, you know, two-thirds of the way through, there's some kind of shift. And I start to think, you know what? You know, she's not bad. She's supposed to be bad. She is an assassin sent back, ostensibly an assassin, sent back to kill this guy, to punish him for what he's done and to fix things or whatever the deal is. But she's not really able to do it she's not yeah. this cold-blooded heartless she's person acting like that person she's trying to pretend to be that person but but because of what elrin has done her father isn't this despot that you know has sent millions to their deaths or whatever her father actually did we i don't think we know exactly but he's kind of become the pursued rather than the pursuer he's become He's become the tormented rather than the tormentor. He's become what he most despises. Mm, no, that's you. <laughs> and, and, and because of that, her upbringing is totally different. I mean, obviously, she wouldn't have existed at all because her father was sterile in the other universe. But had she been born to this despot, like she said, you know, she would have been the princess, you know, that had her way all the time. And that, to me, that's so interesting that... You know, they sent her back to kill this guy or whatever, and, and she's got a part to play. But because of the changes the guy made, even that doesn't work. <laughs> she's got a conscience, or she she understands how the other half lives, or she's got sensitivity that she shouldn't have. And, you know, I have no idea what comes next. The two of them watch the fireworks together, and they usher in this brave new world of 2012. And that's the beauty of ending a story there. Right. Where there's more story to be told, whether it gets told or not, you can fill in the blanks of what happens next. Or the author can come by five years later and say, you know what? I want to know what happens next. And here's my story and all that. But I take back, you know, that she's hard to like. She ultimately proves that that was a facade, that person that I mentioned that about. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That to me is really neat, too. She should be this soulless, horrible monster. And even her father probably is not the monster that he was in the other timeline. Right. Because of seeing how the other half lives. Yeah. And he never went through the circumstances that turned him into that. He can kind of remember them, but he didn't actually experience them. So he didn't actually become that guy. Instead, he became what was considered a nut and put into an asylum or whatever. That's one of those questions that a movie like Total Recall or... Born identity, I guess, to a certain extent is, are you what you remember? You know, Jason Bourne or whatever his real name is, which they forget about in the sequels, has all this training to be this cold-blooded killer. You know, an assassin that you send out there to erase your enemies or to, you know, make difficult people disappear and things like that. But because he loses his memory, he starts over, he can suddenly become something else. And the same deal with Total Recall you know, somebody tells you that you're all these things, you suddenly have these memories, which I guess turn out to be true. But if somebody told you and you could remember all these things, are you that person? Do, do they you turn have out the to children? be true? I don't know. I never saw the new one, but in the original movie. If the movie were better done, 
you would have that question, but I stand by the statement that no. In the original movie, they left it. Well, you and I saw two totally different movies. They tried to leave it uh, up to you anyways, but they end with that stupid, well, if it's all a dream, well, then kiss me quickly before you wake up. That's so weird that you remember that. But, I mean, it hasn't been 22 years for you. Sleazy and demure. What? (laughs) I like that. What does sleazy and demure mean? That's what he tells them. They ask him how he likes his women. Do you like them sleazy, demure? And they give him a couple other options. And he says, "Um, sleazy, uh, demure. And so they made them both. And then later when they show up in Mars and tell them, they're like, and this woman, both sleazy and demure. Huh. Trying to prove to him that it's all fake. I don't know. If you remember ordering the deaths of a thousand people but it's just a fantasy or a dream or somebody's hypnotized you into believing this are you a mass murderer are are we what we remember i i, I don't know i might that's a question that everybody has their own opinion of but anyway i just like that about that even her father i don't know if todd sat down with jaeger or jaeger what did she call it? i don't remember and, and had different. a conversation would it be the same jaeger and my my guess is no because our experiences mold us into who we are regardless of our memories or whatever but maybe you were destined to be this great thing but if you're surrounded by people that change that and the experiences that mold you into a different person Oh, well, I guess free will versus determinism is what I'm talking about. And I'm not educated enough to have that conversation. Yeah, you got to be educated to be able to talk about that. And that's definitely not us. Chalupa for you, Big. It, uh, it's cool when you can get a story that can inspire discussions and thoughts along lines like that or other lines. You know, it's got more to it. It's deeper than just, hey, this thing happened and isn't that neat? And I suppose... You have to have a mind that will explore those kind of things instead of just read it and go, wow, that thing happened. Well, that was neat. Next story. It's one of those things that I really enjoy is when a story's got a good theme to it that teaches you a little bit of a lesson about maybe life without being too hit you over the head with it, didactic. You must do this. All good boys do this. Everybody responds differently, too. I'm sure there's somebody that listened to it and thought it was didactic. And there was somebody that listened to it and thought it was one of those very, very simple stories with little subtext. And then there are other people who liked it even better than we did. And this is a life-changing thing. And there's like, wow, you could write a whole series of novels where it's the same character and you change an, an inciting incident for him. And then you've got a totally different novel with a different chain of events, but they all have the same starting point and the same... Okay, maybe I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, like you know, you that's just, just... got yourself a book series. That's just the fun about fiction and and it's the fun about us having our own fiction magazine i guess is the things that we respond to we get on here and we share with other people and not everybody is us other people have their own podcasts and they i would assume publish stories that they respond to rather than just political reasons or whatever and not always i'll even go as far as to say is not often do i respond the way that they do yeah because you're different there's dozens of magazines and podcasts out there but not everybody listens to or reads all of them or even many of them they just they they find the ones that really agree with them and they go back to those again and again because they know that more than likely it'll be something they respond to something they enjoy i guess that's just how you pick it's like you get an author and you know oh, that's my favorite author i'm gonna read all of his books because Each time you go back, he pleases you again. And so then you're just like, okay, I'll read all of them. And then you get so upset when you finally find that one that didn't please you or something. Well, I'm not you and you're not me. And we've disagreed about stories before. Yeah. And we, if the show continues, we will disagree in the future again. And so it's just lucky that you and I have liked the same stuff a high percentage of times. Yeah, our sensibilities are close. They may not be exactly aligned, but they are definitely close. So usually if one of us likes it, it's likely that the other one will like it. At the very least, enough to go with it. And, and, you know, I think that's a topic for another conversation. 
In fact, I'm thinking of a particular story where we can have this conversation. But there have been times when you're like, oh, dude, this is the best story somebody has sent us this year. And I, was, and I tilt my head like the RCA dog and I wonder, what is it that he responds to so strongly? I mean, it's not a bad story, but he's really excited about this one. And I know there have been stories that I was just like, ooh, wow. And you're like, well, OK, yeah, it's, it's good. But, you know, that kind of thing. Everybody, there were people that used to share like their favorite, their 10 favorite episodes of the Dune Steve right. reference. And it was amazing because it was never the same 10 titles. Often it was always 10 completely different. You know, they didn't even have like three of the same ones. You know what I mean? You could read each person's list and you're just like, okay, first of all, none of these are my 10 favorites. And they also weren't anybody else's 10 favorites. Wow, that's crazy. You know, I, I'm inspired by that. In the comments section or in the forums, I'd love to hear people's give a list of your 10 favorite Toon Steve episodes just so that we can compare and contrast. And, uh, you know, in a future episode, maybe we'll talk about that. But I remember somebody put one of your stories on their list and that, that just made your day. Yeah, it does. I guess it's because I write so few stories that it gets me really excited when someone actually likes it. You know, I'll include a link in the show notes that goes right to that forum page where people put their, those who have already done it, put their uh, top 10 list. Oh, so, so people, there is a thread that's just that. Well, it's not just that, but it includes that. Like somebody got on there and they talked about how they'd finally listened to every episode of the Dune Steef. And now they're going to do their top 10 list or whatever. And then all sorts of other people started doing it as well. So I'll, I'll put a link to that so people can do that. And, uh, you know, if you don't want to sign up for the forums, that's fine. You can just put a comment in the comment section as well. We, we read both, yeah. Yeah, we have both of them there for that very reason, because some people just don't want to make that commitment of making a, another login with another password and et cetera, et cetera. If that's you, then that's fine. We have the comments as well where you can put your list. All right, so I guess that's what we got to say about this story. We've been going on for a while, so in the effort of less suicide attempts, we'll go ahead and cut it off now. Uh, thanks to Tanya for producing today's story for us. And Jonathan C. Gillespie. Thank you for sending us this story. And please forgive us for taking so long to get it out. Hopefully it was worth the wait. It was worth the wait for me because it's such a good story. And I'm, I'm glad that we stuck with it and got it on instead of just refunding it back to him. That word doesn't quite work there, does it? Returning? Re rejecting? Rebooting. Who cares? Uh, so, yeah. Thanks to everybody who listened all the way to this point. And, uh, yeah, I guess uh, that'll be that. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And now it's time for the hate mail of the week. Well, oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Announcer man, what's the deal? We have to do it. Why? Wait, wait why? No, no, I'm just an announcer. Jeez. Uh, okay, it's... well, do you want to read it then, or should I? I honestly don't care. All right, then you read it. No, no, no I was just saying that. I mean, I actually do care quite a bit, really. I mean, when you kind of Read the know. letter. I've already passed it over. Yeah, okay, here we go. Dear Steve guys, I recently heard the reading of Rish's story, Know When to Walk Away, Know When to Run, and I just had to comment. While it was certainly poorly written and plotted, um, maybe it would be better if you read it. All right. I understand. While it was certainly poorly written and plotted, it said way more than its short narrative about Rish's psychology. Obviously, this is a sad, lost loser of a human being. One suffering from both selfishness and self-loathing, mired in arrested development, terrified of intimacy, dealing with both penile inadequacy and impotent frustration, in full denial of his horror and hatred of women, both aware and imprisoned by his almost crippling laziness and apathy, struggling with his own sexual orientation and attempting, rather unsuccessfully, to express himself with no artistic ability, creativity, or talent, most blatantly obvious in his tendency to name every single story he writes after a song he heard on the radio. If Come on, wait a minute, I take exception with that. Only about 70% of my stories have titles stolen from pop songs. 
Fair enough. Uh, should I finish the letter? Do you have to? Well, it wouldn't be right not to. After all, somebody sent it in. Yeah, I guess you're right. <sighs> there has been talk of more stories by Rish Outfield to come, and I'm not sure whether to laugh about this or sit down and cry. You're a sad, unpleasant little man, Rish, and I've no doubt that even the voices in your head are mocking you behind your back. Sincerely, Big Anklevich. Good night, folks. <laughs> Thanks for listening. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. How could you have ever been nominated for a Parsec? Take two. Uh, you know, I think that the uh, the character of Callista is interesting. The the assassin. Uh-huh. I, I made quotes in the air. Uh, for no, that. you didn't. She. You've gotten so lazy. You don't even actually make quotes in the air. Now you just say that you made quotes in the air. All right. <laughs> it's an audio podcast. They never would have known otherwise. <laughs> 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 <laughs>